Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming today. I know this is not the easiest day of the year to be here because we have Thanksgiving plans, I'm sure. Um, I'm very fortunate that uh, my family gathers in Galveston, uh, so I just had to drive in from Galveston this morning as opposed to Dallas, which is my home now. Um, I'm going to speak today about democracy. Um, keeping in mind that we just had the midterms and what the cause and effect of that was, how it's affected the rest of the world, and uh, I've chosen several studies around the world of what, what evidence is a democracy. So what is a democracy? Well, it's a noun, that's the part of speech it is, and basically it's a system of government by which the whole population or eligible members of a state are able to decide the laws under which they live. So the people are able to decide the laws under which they live. These decisions are made by either a vote of the people in a direct democracy or through elected officials who serve on behalf of the people that vote for them. Like we vote for our senators, we vote people in the House, and they choose the things that we want to be represented. Um, we had a direct decision on our vote in Dallas, uh, which is very unusual. We had to, to vote on funding for a place that, we, that is Fair Park. If you've ever been to Dallas for the Texas State Fair, I strongly urge you to come. It's, 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 it's a mood. It's in, it's in the fall. And it's on a huge campus that's Art Deco, and it's the biggest piece of Art Deco in the world, and it has not been preserved properly. So we voted on a referendum to, to uh, fund $300 million for this project to get it back to its original state. Uh, people, architects from all over the world fly into Dallas just to see Fair Park and the Art Deco because it is truly phenomenal. So if you get a chance to go to the State Fair in Dallas, I recommend it. Um, a democracy, the word comes from the ancient Greece word demos, which means people, and kratos, which means rule. Uh, Clothesthenes was the father of democracy, who is considered part of the people and how authority is shared or delegated by the people has changed over time and at different rates in different countries. But over time, more and more of the democratic countries' inhabitants have generally been included. The cornerstones of democracy, freedom of assembly, association, property rights, freedom of religious uh, religion and speech, inclusiveness, equality, citizenship, consent of the governed, voting rights, freedoms from unwanted government deprivation, of, and the right of life, liberty, and minority rights. The notion of democracy has evolved over time. The original direct democracy, now the most common form of a democracy today, is more of a representative democracy, as I mentioned in the beginning where people elect government officials to govern on their behalf, such as a parliamentary or a presidential democracy. For instance, we elected all of our, our senators, uh, we elect our governors, we elect our person that, that we want to send to the main Senate and to the House of Representatives, also our, our president of the United States. This was the midterms, which was in between the presidential term. And, you know, the interesting thing about this midterm was that normally in midterms, which means the president serves for four years, midterms are two years after his, his service. And every time during the midterm, the prevailing party loses a lot of ground. For instance, when Obama was president, he lost 63 seats in the House and in the Senate. Um, uh, Clinton lost 42, um, Bush lost 40, and Trump lost 37. So, you know, things turn over during the midterms. And Biden, I, the count's still out, but I think Biden only lost uh, 29 for, for his whole bit. Don't quote me on that because they're still counting in Alaska and California, of course. So, um, the majority rule, which is the prevalent day-to-day -day decision making of democracies, a supermajority and consensus have also been integral to democracies. The rule first appeared in the 5th century BC in Greece, 
to mean rule of the people in contrast to aristocracy, which meant rule of an elite body. Initially, democratic citizenship was restricted to an elite class, which has later extended to all adult citizens. Several movements in our country changed the format of who could vote, who could participate in a democracy. The 19th Amendment, which was passed in 1920, uh, for women over 30 who owned property were allowed to vote. We didn't like that, so we changed it in 1928. We said any woman over 21 could vote. She didn't have to own property, she didn't have to be 30. Uh, in 1924, Native Americans could vote. In 52 and 65, Asians and Asian Americans could vote. And in 1870, black men could vote. Uh, an absolute monarchy, oligarchy, which is a small number of people rule. Representative democracy, every vote has equal weight and is generally protected by a constitution, which is very important. The direct demo the democracy, which I've mentioned, issues are voted to by individuals. And legal equality, political freedom, and the rule of law are foundational characteristics of a well-functioning democracy. Decision-making methods used in democracies, but majority rule is the dominant form. Freedom of political expression, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and internet democracy are very important to ensure that voters are well informed. Republics, though often associated with democracy because of the shared principle, encompass both democracies and aristocracies. Democracies can be republics or constitutional monarchies like the UK, which brings me to mention Queen Elizabeth has just passed away, as we all know. She served for 70 years as, as the reigning monarch, and she was the longest, the longest reigning monarch ever in the, really the history of the world. And um, the monarchy really did not participate. It was sort of a figurehead that it really didn't participate in the governing body, but they respected each other, and she had 15 prime ministers while she was at her reign. She started with Winston Churchill, if you can imagine, leaping way back into history, and imagine that she, her first prime minister was Winston Churchill. Margaret Thatcher, Boris Johnson, and her last one was Liz Trust, who only lasted for two weeks as a prime minister. And Queen Elizabeth welcomed her at Balmoral Castle, and then five days later, uh, Queen Elizabeth was deceased. Um, she also had 14 U.S. presidents during her seven, 70 years, starting with Harry Truman. Uh, Ronald Reagan was probably her favorite. Ronald Reagan seemed to be everybody's favorite. Margaret Thatcher just thought he was gorgeous and just really cared for him a lot. You know, he was an actor, so I have to bring that up. He was an actor, so he did well in politics. More actors should become politicians. And um, he rode horses with her. You know, Queen Elizabeth loved to ride horses, so did Ronald Reagan. Um, Bush, uh, 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 George W., when Queen Elizabeth came to our country, he, of course, took her to a baseball game. And then after the baseball game was over, he uh, took her back to the locker room, and all of the baseball players formed a conga line on their way out. And she, they, they, they bowed to her and, and acknowledged her. I mean, can you imagine what she was thinking after watching a baseball game and having all the, all the Astros come walking out? But he did. And, you know, she kind of accepted everything, and then Biden was the last one to visit her in 2021. Um, during the Middle Ages, most regions in Europe were ruled by either clergy or feudal lords, and various systems involving elections or assemblies or, were a small part of the population. You know, one of the most interesting statutes about our democracy was taken from a law that was written in 1215 before our Columbus even discovered our country. 1215, Columbus was here in 1492. I mean, what can you say? It was called the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta was the Parliament of England that was, quote, to precede certain rights of the king's subject and implicitly supported what became the English writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus means safeguarding individual freedom against unlawful imprisonment with right to appeal. Individual freedom 
against unlawful imprisonment with rights to appeal. Now, think about if we didn't have habeas corpus, where, what were these crime shows go? All these defense attorneys that are so popular that show up at the last minute and get this poor guy off, we wouldn't have that, but that's habeas corpus. People are allowed to have lawyers. If you don't have the money to have a lawyer, the state provides one. And so um, that's, that's what habeas corpus means. In um, 1679, the English passed the official Habeas Corpus Act, which strengthened the convention that forbade detention, lacking sufficient cause of evidence. The father of our basic current democracy uh, was John Locke, 1689. Individuals would voluntary, voluntarily come together, come together to form the state of purpose of defending their rights. Particularly important were property rights. Uh, governments were only legitimate people if they held the consent of the governed citizens and they had the right to revolt against a government that acted against their interests or became uh, tyrannical. These works were the founding doc documents of liberal thought and profoundly influenced the leaders of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and his liberal democratic framework remains the preeminent form of democracy in the world today. So as you can see, a lot of these things were formed excuse me, quite a while uh, ago, and, you know, they really, they remain valid. I mean, when you think about habeas corpus and uh, the right of counsel, you can't, you just can't lock somebody up because you think you, they should be. Um, there are three contending conceptions of democracy, aggregate, deliberate, and radical. Aggregate solicit citizens' preferences and, and aggregates them together to determine what social policy society should adopt. Therefore, this, they, they focus this on voting. Direct democracy, uh, as I mentioned earlier, citizens vote directly for their laws, not through their representatives of the legislative proposals. Um, I read the uh, Economist, which is a magazine that, or periodical, that the UK puts out. Uh, I think it's monthly or maybe it's bi-weekly. And they do a poll every year on the democracy in the world and what countries represent democracies. And they have um, four categories. They have full democracy, which has to have certain tenets, flawed democracies, hybrid regimes, and authoritarian regimes. Um, the United States is a representative democracy. Most decisions are, are made not by the people themselves, but by representatives. We have a presidential democracy, and the fundamental principles and laws are guided by a constitution. The must-have ingredients for a democracy are a, a, a pluralistic system, that means at least two parties, free and fair electoral process, government openly and transparently uh, citizens have free choice. Politically engaged citizens, there is a lot of apathy in, in, in our country, particularly when you consider that at the midterms only 56% of the people voted, which was a quote, high turnout for midterms. But when you consider that you know, that's not really, that's a big turnout for midterms, but that's sort of a sad state when you have the privilege to be able to vote and you won't even exercise it. Um, you have to preserve civil liberties and personal freedoms and free and independent media, no government interference, influence, or intimidation. The democracy index that I was mentioning that The Economist puts out is 167 of the world's countries, and they, they track 60 indications in five different categories. Electoral process, functioning of government, political participation, political culture, and civil liberties. Countries with a total democracy index scored between eight and 10, considered full democracies. Six to eight were flawed. Now these countries have free and fair elections and civil liberties, but there are faults like low levels of participation as in the US or a heavily partisan 
political culture. Four to six is the hybrid regime, and lower than four is the authoritarian regime. So again, democracy, flawed democracy, hybrid regime, authoritarian. Which section do you think that the United States fit under? Anybody want to guess? Where would they be rated by the economist? Well, perfect. Yes. You know why? Okay. Well, it's it's um, uh, basically we scored a seven point nine, and as I said, between eight and ten were full democracies. We scored a seven point nine. And the reason why is we, we, in our political culture, we only scored a six. In our functioning of government, we only scored a 6.7. And uh, the other two, like civil liberties, eight and a half, and political participation in eight. And it was based on the intolerance of COVID-19 restrictions, distrust in the government, remember January the 6th, bipartisan gridlock, and especially the increasing ideological polarization between Democrats and Republicans are cited as contributed to the lower score. I mean, you can't even have a conversation with somebody now without getting into a huge argument if you're on the other side of the um, equation. You know, I mean, I know a lot of friends won't even talk to each other because they have differences in democracies. They have different thoughts about Republicans. Democrats. Interesting, our neighbor to the north, Canada, scored a 9.22 and uh, full democracy. And our neighbor to the south, Mexico, has a flawed democracy at a 6.07. So the most democratic nations, uh, I have 10 of them listed. Can anybody venture, like, who would be in these 10? Canada. Well, I just told you it's an unvote. Okay, Canada. Anybody else? Iceland. Iceland, yeah. Swedish. Where? Oh, uh, is that Swedish? Sweden. Oh, Sweden. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Sweden. Yeah. I think most countries in the northern world, they're all somewhere in there. Pardon? Um, like most of them are going to be in the northern uh, Europe. You're right. Yeah. Number one is Norway, 9.8. Iceland's 9.5. Sweden's a 9.3. New Zealand's 9.2. Finland's a 9.2. Ireland's a 9.2. Canada's a 9.2. Denmark's a 9.2. Australia's a 9, and Switzerland's a 9. So those are, you know, the, the top tens. Um, uh, but um, I just. We have been a flawed democracy since 2016 because this is when we, um, uh, the far right seemed to have a lot of their rhetoric, uh, their rhetoric dominate the news and it, it sort of eroded a lot of the beliefs that what was actually true about what was going on in, in our country. Um, U.S. actually ranks 30 first in voter turnout. That's pretty bad. Behind Colombia, Austria, and the UK. Um, in the 2020 presidential election, we had the biggest voter turnout we've ever had. 66% turned out to vote. That was the highest ever. Now, keep in mind, Uruguay has 94.9% of the people vote. Turkey has 89%, and Peru has 83%. So they're all in different, well, Uruguay and Peru are in South America, but it's, it's sort of interesting to see what countries. Another thing I found interesting in my studies is that when we turn 18, we can register to vote either through your driver's license, you go online, post office, there's a lot of places to vote. We have to make a step to register to vote. In, in a lot of countries, they're, you're automatically registered when you turn 18 or 20 or whatever the voting age happens to be. However, that has nothing to do, you know, I thought, well, maybe it's because we have to take a step to register to vote, so that's why we don't. But even in the countries that are automatically in, enrolled in the voting mechanism, they don't have good participation either. 
So just taking that step really isn't what impedes people to vote. Um, Japan and Sweden automatically are enrolled, the UK, and they actually uh, uh, have their turnout in line with the US. Um, hybrid regi regimes, which I mentioned in the Economist uh, survey, neither a democracy or a dictatorship, but combines elements of both. Hybrids hold a competitive election, but curtail separation of power, protection of property rights, freedom of speech and assembly. Hybrid regimes have regular elections, and the opposition is able to organize itself politically. Normally, their leaders are typically populists. And when I say populist, it's the, the style of, I'm just an ordinary person, even though they might be the son and daughter of millionaires. They just always bring up, I'm an ordinary person, and they always show themselves at a chicken shack getting fried chicken or something. That's what they, how they normally do with, with the locals. And it's, it's that, that's their style. Um, I don't say you shouldn't trust people that get chicken in a chicken shack, but it's just, that's, that's the way they present themselves. Um, that usually excludes ethnic minorities. The more the economy improves, the more rep repressive the regime becomes. Two typical examples of hybrid regimes are Viktor Orban of Hungary and Tajik Erdogan of Turkey. These are both hybrid regimes. I'll talk more later about what Orban and Erdogan have done to their countries. Then we have the authoritarian regime, and that has a concentration of power in a leader or an elite that's not constitutionally responsible to the people. They will allow social and economic institutions not under government control that they will tend to rely on passive mass acceptance rather than popular support. And some typical authoritarian regimes are Russia, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. A way of governing that values order and control over personal freedom. That is a government run by a dictator. A way of governing that values order and control over personal freedom. What's going on in Iran right now? I mean, if that isn't a typical example of um, not allowing personal freedom. So, and I don't know if any of you are soccer fans and watch the FIFA game and when Iran stood up during the presentation and they wouldn't sing their national anthem because they were, they were very upset about what's going on in their, in their country. And, you know, it's things like this, these passive presentations of what the people feel, that I think things like this are very much needed in our world to show that these authoritarian regimes, maybe they're not making everyone happy. Although, I feel that, I, I hope those young men don't have consequences when they return to their own country, because a lot of times the authoritarian regimes will do that. So, um, democracies have declined. In 20, 21, 25 countries have improved and 60 have declined. In 2020, it was 28.73. In 2014, it was 33.62. In 2006, it was 56.59. The leaders of China, Russia, and other dictatorships have been successful in shifting global attempts of democracies. What can we do to score a full a 10 on full democracy. Here's an interesting factoid which led up to the January 6th riot. There is an obscure law in our country, 135 years old, known as the Electoral Count Act. That's the Electoral Count Act, 135 years old. And basically this act has a confusing and ambiguous provision, and legal scholars have long warned that it could trigger a crisis, which is what happened after the 2020 election. Donald Trump exploited the law's arcane language to claim that they could overturn the voters on January 6th. What this rule states is that 
it's very easy for members of Congress to object and delay the final count of electoral votes on January to 6. Any objection lodged by only one representative and one senator will do the trick. So they could delay the whole process by having one Ted Cruz and one Josh Hawley introduce meritless objections to slow the process. And that was, quote, legal from the electoral count law, 135-year-old law. Now, there are new bills that would raise the bar by requiring at least one-fifth of both houses of Congress to sign on before an objection can be lodged and strictly limiting the grounds for any objection. The reform bills would also clarify, clarify that the vice president's role on January 6 is purely ministerial. The vice president has no authority to throw out electoral votes or accept a different slate. And as you recall, during that January 6th riot, the rioter, rioters were running through the Capitol saying, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence. And if anyone has um, seen his interviews about his new book that he is putting out, his entire um, book is based on um, in the January 6th, and what happened to him and what he was thinking during that time. So, um, and he realized he had no control over the outcome of the election, but the crowd was not educated and tried to get him to change his mind. So uh, that's, that is going on now. So um, Congress can also do more to protect the integrity of a presidential election before the electoral votes arrive in Washington. Election deniers remain a, a potent force on the right. More than 220 candidates in this last election who question the 2020 election results have won state or federal office, and 30 said the election was stolen or rigged. 220 candidates. Um, and We've proven everything that the election was not stolen. It was not rigged. We recounted votes in every state. Uh, we even have tapes of Donald Trump asking Ryan Kemp, the governor of the state of Georgia, if he could just find 18,000 more votes for him and threatening that he was going to uh, uh, come after the state. If he, I mean, it, 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 it's all documented. It's out there. Um, and it's, it's, it's sad that people all over the world hear this. Um, the, re the reforms proposed make it clear that state officials must count their votes according to state laws in place on election day. They may not change the result after the fact because they don't like it. For instance, Carrie Lake right now in Arizona, she was running for governor, she did not win, and now she is trying to claim that the votes weren't counted properly. So uh, we'll see how that turns out. But uh, I think that ship has sailed. We can't say that anymore about the votes haven't been counted properly. I, I think people are tired of hearing that. And I think we have, I think this election proved that we sort of, we moved on. The new bill will steer disputes over vote tallies to the courts where judges, not partisan officials, have the final say. Congress needs to pass an overhaul now before the 2024 elections. I mean, you know, you have people at the, at, that are counting the votes or saying, well, maybe I counted wrong. You know, it's, that's not where the final decision should be made about the vote counting. Um, another thing that I think would be more favorable for a democratic process is, is the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling, um, the federal government can borrow money it needs to meet its obligations over the next two years, including recent and important increases in federal funding for expanding the production of renewable, renewable energy, investing in roads, high-speed internet, unleaded pipes and infrastructure, and support local government, including money for law enforcement. Now, just as on, a, on a, something to uh, that I found out that was exceedingly alarming about our country. Um, I was asked to be on a water board. 
Um, it was a board that had some kind of proprietary program where they could make water out of something like uh, rainbows. I mean, it was, it didn't make sense, but I, I listened to their pitch. And in hearing the pitch, I found out that there's 2,000 counties in the United States of America that have water that is as unsafe to drink as Flint, Michigan's was. 2,000 counties in the United States of America because they still have those old lead pipes that are leaching that lead. Now, it's not in Texas because we're a newer state and we've got newer pipes, but it's all in the vast Midwest and, you know, ironically, you would call it the Rust Belt. I mean, is it in our country, 2,000 counties. So we do need money for that infrastructure and um, I'm hoping they will be able to get it. Um, at some point next year, the debt ceiling will be reached, of course, it always is. And why can we, you know, it's interesting, why can the United States act be in a deficit society? I mean, why can we have a deficit government and a deficit country? And it's because of the full faith and credit of the United States of America and our you know, people are always, they'll buy more treasury bills and the treasury bills pay interest and the people that buy the treasury bills are supporting the debt of our country. We have a lot of ownership because it's the, it's the safest, it's the safest entity for any kind of investment. You know, it's interesting, um, Japan owns, is the highest owner, I believe, of U.S. treasury bills, um, which is fascinating. Um, so, anyway, I'm glad other countries are very, um, uh, feel very good about, about our debt, uh, which I do too. And anyway, in 2023, the debt ceiling will be reached for the government to pay its bills. Um, Congress must raise the limit, as they always do. Again, the House Republicans will threaten to withhold consent, making a global financial crisis to compel the White House to accept reductions in federal spending. So um, what happens will, that will happen is we'll have a lot of our, we'll raise the debt ceiling, but not to the level that we need for our infrastructure, for our, um, you know, to get rid of our lead pipes, but we will have to give a lot of concessions and will we get all the money we need? I Probably not, but um, and we'll see what, what's going to be cut from the budget. The last time the Republicans engaged with this was 2011, when the possibility that the government might fail to meet its obligations produced a measurable increase in the interest rate the government had to pay to borrow money. In other words, they had to increase the interest rate on their, on their treasury bills that people bought. This cost the taxpayers an estimated $1.3 billion. It imposed limits on federal spending that also delayed the recovery from the 2008 financial crisis, which was a debacle. At that time in 2008, the rest of the world was even saying that the U.S. dollar should not be the currency that everybody trades from, that they should have a basket of currencies that would more represent the world. And that the, you know, because all currencies trade off the U.S. dollar. And if you've been watching the European markets lately, every time the dollar has gone down in the last couple of weeks, the European markets go up, the Asian markets go up. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a bellwether of what's going on in the economy. You can tell it by where the dollar is. Um, some people feel that there's no reason to have a debt ceiling. And others feel it, it, if we did not have a ceiling, it would lead to reckless spending. So should we just have an open checkbook or should we have a ceiling? You know, I think you can argue both sides and you just have to believe in your leaders that they're not going to do something absolutely horrendous with our full faith and trust in our money. So anyway, um, I hope he's okay. Uh, so we, you know, that's, um, there's arguments for both. Um, the, 
The, another issue about our broken state is, is our immigration system. Um, and, and, you know, I think we need to address the process by which migrants can claim asylum. Senator John Cornyn of Texas said that the core of the bill would significantly increase the government's capacity to propose to process asylum claims by allowing those with legitimate fear of persecution. I mean, a lot of these poor people are coming from countries where they can't get jobs and they're persecuted and for, for different reasons to settle safely in the U.S. and make it more difficult for those people without legitimate claims to enter, the, to enter or remain. Um, basically, this last midterm election, we managed to dodge a big arrow. I think it's political correct, politically correct to say dodge an arrow now instead of a bullet since we're shooting so many people now. So that's why this journalist decided to say America was dodged an arrow. Um, we can all hold off now on moving to Canada. We don't have to call the New Zealand Embassy to find out how to be a citizen there, but a lot of my friends were thinking, you know, if we have any more riots during during this time after our midterms, that might be their only solution. November 8th election was the most important test since the Civil War of whether the engine of our constitutional system, our ability to a peaceful and legitimately transfer power remains intact. We did pull through, and for which I'm so grateful that we're now not looking on CNN of people rioting in different state houses around our country that their candidate didn't get the proper amount of votes. I mean, seriously, we, I think at some point we might have been headed that way. Um, a lot of the election denials, denialism central to campaigns lost, which aimed at the heart of our democracy. It could not have been a better time as the leaders of both Russia and China had manipulated their systems to entrench themselves in power beyond their previously established terms of office. Let's take Putin in Russia. The Russian constitution, for what it's worth, allows um, a six-term limit, a re-election, max is 12 terms. Putin became the president in 2000. In 2008, he was the prime minister, selected as the prime minister. And Medeev, as you recall, or may not recall, in 2008, was elected president. In a real shift of power, Putin traded with him, and he said, look, I think I want to be president. You can go ahead and be prime minister. So he switched the roles in 08, and he became president. So that meant he was then elect again in 2012, re-elected in 2018, and um, in 2020, he changed the Constitution that in 2024, he can add two more six-term elections. So therefore, Putin is allowed to, has allowed himself to remain in power until 2036. He'll be 84. I don't know how old y'all will be, but I'll, you know, he'll be 84 in 2036. And, you know, that he can, and this is what we call a typical authoritarian regime. He can do this, this is what he's doing, and um, um, there we have it. Um, I think when leaders of the other country, other countries see the greatest democracy in the world, have issues like January 6th, have all of these horrible claims about our government and, and the ugly, just the ugliness that has gone on lately that has been tolerated. For instance, Nancy Pelosi, you know, she was the, she was the Speaker of the House and she's been one of the longest running uh, speakers and, and in the House for, I believe it's 30, 35 years. Her husband, as you know, was brutally attacked in California by one of the January 6th types that was trying to find Nancy. And he was, he's 82 years old, and the guy beat him over the head with a hammer. Now, I mean, how easy is an 82-year-old going to be able to recover from massive blows to your skull? And a lot of the things that, 
that came up after on in social media were that it was a, an actually a male prostitute that uh, Mr. Pelosi had had relationships with that was trying to settle a debt with him and just really ugly, mean things about him. Um, you know, it, it's our, our country is just denigrated to like the lowest level, and um, uh, you know that's a reason why our political culture does not score high on the democracy table because we have ugliness so much more and it's I think it's so much more profound because we have so many accesses to see what is actually happening in the world if we want to um, President uh, Xi uh, when uh, at, at a commencement address in May, um, Biden recalled a, uh, a phone call from President Xi of China congratulating him on, the 20, on his 2020 election. And he said, quote, democracies cannot be sustained in the 21st century. Autocracies will rule the world. Why? Things are changing so rap rapidly, democracies require consensus, and it takes too much time, and you don't have the time. So for that reason, both uh, Xi and Russia's President Putin, and the Supreme Leader in Iran, as he's now calling himself, but he is facing an uprising by the Iranian women, they lost on the, in November 8th on their elections too. Um, because the more wild and unstable our politics, the less able we become to peaceful transfer power, the easy it is for them to justify never doing so. And I think the only way we can rise above this is to set a good example for the rest of the world. And I hope the midterms were an exercise in heading to that direction. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of things are still eating away at the foundations of our American democracy are still around. Our primary system, gerrymandering, social networks have steadily poisoned our national dialogue, polarizing our society into political tribes, and eroded our twin pillars of our democracy, which is truth and trust. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of people in this country that innocently think that Trump was reelected. In 2020, I mean, they really sincerely think that he was reelected, even after we've disproved it over and over again. Um, and I think that's that's a real sad statement of our time. Without being able to argue, agree on what is true, we don't know which way to go. At least it seems like we're edging back from the brink, and it's because enough Americans still fall into, into the independent or centrist camp and do not want to keep dwelling on the grievances, lies, and fantasies. Um, I'm not sure if any of you, I mean, I, I only have maybe two or three friends that have no feeling whatsoever about politics, that we get together and a political conversation never surfaces. And, and that's, I think that's pretty phenomenal in this day and time because I think everybody ends up at some point in their conversation, friends, enemies, relatives, whatever, discussing politics. It just seems to be the forefront of our, of our country. I mean, you turn on TV and that's all you see are all of these pundits who know something. Here I am talking about it here at Rice in your lecture. So here we go. Um, Rep Republican Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, and Democrat Elaine Lucia. They spearheaded the January 6th investigation in Congress, and unfortunately, they all ended up being forced out of office as a result. None of them were reelected. Hopefully, we will behave healthy, build back strength, and return in 24 months for another checkup. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we're on the right road. Now, just in conclusion, I just want to outline, I, uh, I feel very fortunate I have traveled all over the world. I was in Iran in 2015. I spent three weeks in Iran with the New York Times. And to this day, I regret my words. There were a lot of Brits on the tour and 
there were a couple of Canadian service people from Argentina, and they all said, is Trump going to win? And I just laughed. I said, oh, no there's, no, there's not a doubt. Fortunately, they don't have my contact information to follow up with, really. <laughs> so anyway, I've also predicted we're not going to have a recession, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But uh, at any rate, um, yeah, so I have been, I'm just exceedingly interested in world politics. Right now, what's happening in Europe, one of the scariest things that just happened is that uh, Georgia Melonia was just elected to be the Prime Minister of, of Italy. This is the land that invented fascism. This is the most far right backing in power. She belongs to a party called the Nationalist Brothers of Italy Party. And the founder of that party was Benito Mussolini. And you know what Mussolini did in the World Wars. So that is the party that she represents. And she's 45 years old, and she was just elected prime minister. Now, this is a significant moment, not just for Europe, but for all Western liberal democracies. There's one dominant story in Western politics over the past 10 years. The far right is no longer just out there. If they have now taken over right wing mainstream in many countries. In France, the far right has been leading the leading force of the opposition. In Spain, it has also gained ground. In Sweden, a party founded by neo-Nazis and other right-wing extremists will now be the second largest faction in parliament. In Hungary and Poland, the far right is already in power. Maloney has condemned Jewish Americans that live in her country. She has proposed to deny citizenship to children born in Italy to foreign parents and to cut foreigners' access to welfare benefits. And, you know, Italy right now has Europe's highest unemployment rate and the lowest birth rate, which is interesting because they're a bunch of Catholics and you think that they'd be having a lot of babies like they used to, but they don't anymore. So, anyway, I'm a Catholic, so I can, I can, just, I can say that to, about my own. Sweden, this was scary. Their recent election, where the far right is now the second largest party in the country, and now the kingmakers in ongoing coalition talks. Isolation of the party has fed the party's self image as martyrs, and they've nurtured even more loyalty among their supporters. A party described as having neo Nazi roots has tapped into anti immigrant sentiment and won more than 20% of the vote in elections earlier this month, enough to give it some influence. And I saw a clip about this party, and it looks like a clip from the 30s and 40s, because they do like a heel click and a, and a Nazi salute when they all get together and talk, and it's, it's just a frightening flashback to see them carry on that way. Then we have Hungary. We have uh, Viktor Orban, who has put a barbed wire fence along his border so nobody from Serbia can, can come into his country. The refugee boys are sleeping in the dirt, and the border guards are making trouble and not allowing any journalists to, to, to be there. This reveals the very modern kind of authoritarian state Hungary has become. In eight years, Orban has chipped away the foundations of Hungarian democracy. It has been replaced with an authoritarian regime that, inter that, that interpretation of the law he uses as a weapon. The government controls the airwaves, the media, and such a degree that the opposition can't even get a fair hearing. Uh, Fidesz, uh, F-I-D-E-S-C, is Orban's party that's, that um, stands up bogus opposition parties. I mean, makes up parties so it looks like he has opposition during parliamentary elections as means of dividing the anti-Fidesz vote. International monitors are now on Orban in Hungary, concluding um, uh, that, that Orban is demonizing refugees and Muslims and touts the regime as the only thing protecting the country from an Islamic takeover. 
the EU Parliament voted last week to label Orbán's government a systematic threat to the rule of law. So that is scary. During 1990 to 2010, Hungary's post-communist history was young but a stable democracy. International observers touted as the model of a successful trans transmission. And then when Trump hosted Orbán in uh, the US when he was in office, he um, uh, knighted Orbán as the Lone Star State of Europe. Uh, then we have Duda in Poland. He uh, has a uh, focus on anti-LGBT sentiment. Um, he also put into law, uh, which I think is exceedingly cruel, Poland had the largest number of Jewish citizens before the Holocaust that lived in Poland. He has now said that the Jewish families are not allowed to claim properties that they own prior to the extermination that belongs to the state now, and they have no rights to claim them. France, this is seemingly scary. We have Marine Le Pen, who lost her race against Macron earlier this year. She did get 41% of the votes. Four years ago, she only got 7%. Marine, if Marine Le Pen wins, she will be the most far-right candidate in the EU, with which, when she's elected, she will immediately draw from the EU and go into that protectionist um, issue. Her party, the National Party in France, has gained eight, nine seats, up from two from the prior election in Parliament. Last week, when one of her colleagues in Parliament, not one of the uh, National Party, but one of the other parties, was speaking to the parliament. He was black. One of the National Party members yelled out, go back to Africa. And then they all stood up and clapped. Um, the party is anti-Semitic and xenophobic. This is France. Then we have Turkey. Um, Erdogan is a real number. He, uh, he cr the roles he created. President becomes head of government as well as state and can retain political party ties. President is given sweeping powers with ability to enact laws by, by decree and dismiss parliament. Parliament no longer is able to scrutinize ministers. Parliament is given limited powers to investigate or impeach the president. So he's locked himself in for life. Oh, by the way, Putin uh, in 2020 wrote a law into the Constitution that anyone who was ever the president of Russia has never has a lifetime of exoneration from anything that he might have done illegally and can never be tried or processed. So he can do anything he wants for the rest of his life and he never have to, to answer to any legal commitments. All right, moving on to Germany. You know, I really miss Angela Merkel. She held, I think she held the EU together during a real bad time. And, they now have a coalition party that's ruling, and it's called, um, it is a coalition party, but there's an underlying party called the AFD, the Anti-Immigrant Party Alternative for Germany, which was put under suspicion of trying to undermine Germans' democratic constitution. It has maintained a small foothold that the conditions are perfect for a populist resurgence in Europe. Um, what can we do? I, you know, I just hearken back to we are considered the premier democracy in the world, even though we've had some bumpy roads, and we need to get back on that track, and we need to set an example in our country. As, you know, fanciful as that might sound, that we can do it, and do I think we're better than everybody else? No, but we, we have been a good democracy, and I think we need to continue to create that vision for our country. That's it. Well, fortunately, we have some time for questions. If anybody wants questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, Ms. Lewis, so. Now, one of your students had a question. All right, let's have a question. Um, so do you believe that polarization the way it is now can be reversed, or is it more of a positive feedback? Uh, so oh, I'm sorry. The polarization of, um, of the two-party system in the U.S., or what, how can we reverse that? 
you know, that's really difficult. It really is difficult because um, uh, we just have to, we have to reverse it. Um, and, and it's, it's so sad that every time we have a major shooting in our country, the answer is to everybody to get more guns. And, you know, there are people on one side that are just totally opposed to weaponizing people. And then you have people on the other side. You know, we can now buy an AR assault weapon rifles, I don't even know what they're called, assault weapon rifles in the state of Texas without a permit. You know, I mean, there has to be a middle ground. And I think until people are actually affected in their own families or in their own lives from one of these horrible events, do they start to feel like maybe we should all join, maybe this isn't a good way, maybe we should join together? I wish I could answer that question. And I think, you know, with Elon Musk now controlling Twitter and maybe coming back and allowing a lot of these hate groups to be on the platform or whatever you know, they, they ban, I don't know that that's going to be such a good thing. So I, I, I wish I could. I'd like to see the polarization end. But I think the midterms, I think, I think that was a good step ahead. John, <laughs> Dr. Delmore, did you have a question? Ms. Lois, so what is a recession? Why is it a big deal? And why do you think we're not going into Oh, now that wasn't in my talk. OK. Well, a recession is three consecutive quarters of negative GDP. And why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because our goods and services um, are under fire. I mean, here's a horrible thought. 75% of the United States GDP is retail sales. Now, isn't that dreadful? You I mean, what kind of a country is 75% of their GDP retail sales? OK, the reason why I don't think we're going into a recession is there's full employment. And there's, even with all the layoffs in the tech world right now, we still have, million, uh, you know, I think it's 980,000 jobs that are on, uh, on the job, uh, job list. We have a 3.7 unemployment rate. That's not recession territory. Recession territory is double digit. Our GDP is still growing at 3.9%. So uh, we're raising, and we're raising interest rates. And yes, we should, and we let them live for too long. And my parents bought a home in 1964, and they had a 6% 6 mortgage. In 1964, a 6% mortgage. My husband and I bought a home in 1981 and had a 24% mortgage. Right now, we're able to buy homes in 2022 in an inflated housing market environment, which everyone will agree, with a 6% mortgage. Is that so inflationary? I don't, you know, I, I don't think so. I think we should have raised our rates. So those are, those are my reasons. I mean, the consumer is still spending. The consumer is still employ, employed. Um, those are reasons why I, I think that we won't go into recession. However, if we keep on with all the negative talk by all the pundits and all the so-called economists, in my opinion, economists are only good as historians. And they, you know, they, they're talking up a recession. And, um, you know, that, that might feed on people's psyche. But that, that is why. But that, I didn't do a lot of due diligence today, so I'm just taking numbers that I kind of remember. Well, someone needs to get out this rather positive news on this. <laughs> Well, there are a few economists who say maybe in 2023, maybe it'll be delayed to 2024. And I think the Fed might not be tight, tightening another 75 bips the next time. I think they're talking about 50 bips. So that should be a positive thing. And I think we build enough houses and apartments for everybody in the world to live here. So we can have a place to live, um, it seems. What would you say to the class if they're interested in kind of building an nest egg? Diversification. I'd call Vanguard or Fidelity, and I'd take whatever amount. I mean, they have the lowest um, sales uh, fees, 
and I'm by diversified mutual funds right now. And I just, and, and you know, I mean, you know how I made a lot of money in my IRA? Um, dollar cost averaging. And that means that's an old fashioned term, which means every month out of my paycheck, X amount of bucks would go into my IRA, which was in mutual funds. From 1982 to 19, I guess, 2010, I put a min the maximum amount in my IRA, which in some years it was only $3,500. That was the maximum amount. I, what is it now? I mean, I'm beyond us. 6,000, I'm beyond IRA age, so I don't, you know, contribute. But between those years, my dollar cost averaging, uh, my IRA in 2010 was worth uh, $998,000, almost a million dollars, just by dollar cost averaging, contributing the maximum I could every year from 1983 when IRAs were first founded on to 2010. So I have $3,500 a year, $4,000 a year, $5,000, you right. get up to a million dollars, mm -hmm. kind of without notice. Right. Right. And they were in different mutual funds, you know, growth funds, uh, small cap, large cap. When I got older, I put more money into bonds, treasuries. Well, I tell you what, you know, we just have, we touch on so many topics in this course, and you've had first-hand experience in all of them. <laughs> so this is our chance to kind of think a little bit strategically as a political nation. It's all about politics. Actually, politics is just about differences. And so it's all politics, as they say. So. You know, I think I have tried to listen more to, you know, an answer to your question about polarization. You know, some you know when some people start, you just know what they're going to say. It's going to be very negative. You're very against what you're thinking, and but maybe I should listen more. And you know, maybe I should start thinking. Maybe I should listen to them. Uh, as much as I don't want to, as much as I disagree. Maybe I should listen. So <laughs> that might be good. <laughs>